Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Nidio. Uh, I'm the CTO of a company called Action Inc. Um, so I have invited today to speak about. I might make my phone Ah, okay. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Okay. I should do this soft spoken. Um, so normally the presentations I give are a bit more um, technical, involve a bit more equations uh, and uh, rigor, but uh, I'm just trying to kind of speak today in the pseudo code of this English. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to make today to talk about uh, smart contracts. So I thought rather than kind of delve into kind of the uh, four methods that I work on today, uh, I thought I'd give a kind of I had a little overview about what I wish I knew about smart contracts before I got into the space. So, kind of the goals for my talk today are going to be what should you, as a non technical entrepreneur, know about the smart contract space, and what can I, as a technical entrepreneur, impart to you uh, to help you on your, your path toward building your successful smart contract business. Um, so, in particular, um, what are the technical threats to your business on the road, and what should you be looking at for the next generation of the space? So, let's start with some terminology. Um, smart contracts, they're really going to make this. Uh, <laughs> there are many things to many people. Um, but generally, they're usually not smart and they're usually not complex. Um, <laughs> smart contracts are effectively programs uh, that run on the blockchain, in most definitions. Um, but generally, they're quite simple pieces of logic, and generally, they're not legal contracts in the legal sense. Um, so, what does agile mean to? Um, so, I'm CTO of this company. Uh, we're here in London, in the States, and in Switzerland. Um, so, the more reason of our uh, business is we build settlement networks for creating executable forms of industry standard contracts, like business and even agreements, or modeling structured financial products, which is where there's swaps options uh, on mutually distributed budgets. Uh, so, I don't work in the public chain space, I'm in the days. I'm in the digital. I work on private settlement networks between uh, financial institutions, just in London, and other houses. Um, primarily, we look at modeling executable forms of OTC derivatives contracts. So, uh, I'm particularly focused on taking a description of the semantics uh, that involve the temporary rights and obligations of counterparties or a party to a derivatives trade, and then modeling that as code, and then putting that on the distributed database uh, so that uh, we can have more efficient uh, settlement systems. Uh, so, the more interesting part of our business is that we also spend quite a bit of time doing research and development on what I would call as um, third and fourth generation blockchains. So, when I started out company, um, <coughs> actually, just kind of, uh, so I, I do a bunch of research and development on very high engaging formal methods, such so things like uh, CD snarks and uh, reasoning about the semantics of contracts. Um, so, the assumptions that I made for starting my business is the core assumption was that consumers must know what their smart contracts do and if they behave correctly. That turned out to be false um, <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Um, a, most of most smart contracts are not actually realized. They exist only in web work. Um, the ones that are running are generally group of concepts where if they run correctly or don't run correctly, nobody really cares. Um, and Third, uh, most of the developers who are writing smart contracts in space are quite fine with their individual flaws in contracts because generally they're not um, economically invested in the long term success of that contract. Um, so we end up with this, this space, or this cesspool as they call it, uh, of contracts that exist on the public chain, uh, of which you are five or so running successfully um, that are not uh, trivial token registries. So, when I say the space is, so let's go into the kind of hard truth about the space a bit. Space is very early. I think kind of 1990s era internet. Um, there's a lot of promising ideas that are emerging, but I would say there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of um, irrational thinking. So we're very much in the kind of web bang and Yahoo era of the crypto uh, smart contract space. Um, there are shocking new smart contracts that I should know. Um, <laughs> there may be about five in the world. Um, there are a lot of token registries. That's about it. Um, <laughs> the ones, the you know, the augers and the of the world are largely spectacular failures. Um, 
because a lot of engineers have put the engineering effort into building robust contracts for funded issues. And then there are very, many, many really, really good ideas about uh, smart contracts that are simply not realizable for technical reasons. And so, the primary thesis of this talk would be think and do due diligence on technology before you invest uh, more time and resources in building these contracts. Um, so, let's talk about why. So, that's kind of the dark side of this talk, and it's like kind of the light side about what we can do about those things. Um, do your research before jumping in first into a project. Make sure that what you can do is actually realizable on the public chain network, the private chain networks, um, and the contracts that you're trying to model, uh, you have a clear idea in your mind about what they should do um, before you start trying to execute them code. Um, so when we talk about smart contracts, we just go back to first principles and talk about what we need for principles. Um, I need a piece of logic that coordinates an agreement between counterparties. Um, run on a network with certain properties um, baked into the network itself. So one is that uh, individuals and parties have a unique address uh, that can be used to transfer, transfer data uh, and transact with each other um, via persistence. Uh, data is distributed across the network and can be shared in two by contracts. Um, and we have another condition. Uh, so parties cannot speak the existence of transactions on the network and they cannot alter uh, counterparties' data. Uh, I also claim assets as well. Uh, so on the chain networks, quite often we have an ambient cryptocurrency. Um, this is useful for some contracts. Um, but it's also you can derive everything. Um, you can derive assets from having data. data assets are basically just uh, registries of value that people now would gain. So you know, data you can model assets. Um, they're not going to do it yet. Um, I think they've been around nearly as long as we've had electronic trade systems. Um, what is new, however, with blockchain is that we have um, distributed databases that have unique properties. So they're largely you know, global, decorruptible sources of truth um, that we can build um, you know, computational logic into uh, that we can use to mediate um, uh, you know, transactions and uh, you know, human workflows on smart contracts. Um, so I claim that a smart contract is a programmatic description of sequence of touchpoints that acts in as data and reach an agreement on some time during sense of price and obligations and counterparties. So I that a smart contract, and that's not as good as you can get. Um, the issues with the second generation are that I learned the hard way when trying to build a lot of trivial smart contracts um, is that the technology is rather mature. Uh, and this is why my company spends so much of time working on what I would call third and fourth generation. Uh, systems because um, chains that exist today are not going to exist forever. Um, we're going to need to be able to write more complex logic on the chain. Um, we're going to be able to have half more languages that we can express uh, richer, tighter ideas on the chain. Um, right now, if you have a smart contract, I think you'll find that you're working on a level that's far, far, far below the problem that we need to work on. If you're working at the level of bit shifting and hashing, uh, we should be working at the level of what is my counterparty and you're transacting about. Um, it's a lot of talent in space. Um, the token value, I think, creates reverse incentives and scams. Um, <coughs> the current languages we have are too long. Uh, they're normally difficult to use uh, The solidity, I think, makes PHP look like a word of genius. Uh, <laughs> 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 if you're uh, not that good person, it's not. Um, <laughs> we need mature type systems for reasoning about um, the behavior of our languages and contracts right before they run. Um, and we need to be able to have a current state of privacy. Um, we need to be able to transact on ledger, uh, off ledger data, uh, in order to observe the privacy constraints and mask economic details of trades because this simply can't uh, comply with existing. Legislation and um, data governance laws or use the economic interests of firms we transact with uh, if you know, everything is stored in the clear on this global networks. Um, so that's a big problem. I think it's a problem that's not addressed particularly well in the current generation. But you know, space is definitely going to grow. Um, 
So I think the biggest issue with smart contracts is you lack the capacity to reason about the code you write. Um, so when I say reason about, I mean to ask questions. So if you're going to represent you know, contracts, which are agreements uh, between people about a workflow that varies in time, um, and you go to our lawyers to ask questions about you know, what does this apply for my business, uh, my personal interests, my bank account. Um, we should be able to ask our digital lawyers or our software to analyze our contracts and ask questions and questions we ask our lawyers. So these are questions that are basically at the simplest level. Will something P predicate always happen? Will never happen? Is it true for all possible states in the contract? Will it eventually be true? If P ever becomes true, then at some point will P become true. If some point P becomes true, then will it stay true? So anybody who's kind of delved into the world of formal methods knows this is a description about the high-level uh, predicates in tumble logic. Uh, so I think the properties that we want to state about our contracts can be phrased as tumble logic problems. And we can have those two questions about contracts that become more natural. And does my contract ever terminate? This is a question that's shockingly hard to ask of a giant pile of slippery code that somebody hands you. I mean, does my contract be capital address? Does my contract accept nonsensical input state reads? Like, say, if the library data goes, this is, you know, nonsensical, and it's that is, you know, 2.3, will my contract be active? Um, <coughs> does my contract allow me to opt out of my home party? My home party disappears. Does my contract comply with the UK residency laws? When does my contract have cash flow events? Uh, does my contract allow me to save the alter terms with my level of contribution? So this is something called like innovation. Two kind of parties agree that they should change the economic details of a trade, and they do that in the local agree. Um, <coughs> does the contract allow that? We should be able to ask these things. Uh, does my contract allow perfectly fair voting? If it's a, say, an equity or something? Um, does my contract uh, not allow a single party to empty it? <laughs> uh, this is the point of some. Um, Dispute about the current generation of uh, slavery contracts. Um, so, the term that I'll be exploring around in space kind of haphazardly is that we need formal verification. So, quite often that's usually where the uh, state can usually end. We need formal verification. What does that actually mean? Um, so, there's a lot of people that are looking at this, and I claim a lot of these uh, approaches get confused. So, there's kind of two levels of formal verification. Um, one is at the implementation level. So do we know that the underlying platform itself is correct? So is, it, is the implementation of, say, the agreement virtual machine a fair and faithful mapping from the algorithm? I mean, there's no, there's no more proof that it is. I mean, this does not have generic behavior or, you know, between the shell and free address. Um, that's a problem. I think that's largely actually being addressed. Um, there's some large body of work about how to formally verify an implementation of a language is correct. This is the most studied for the last 20 years. I think a more interesting problem, and one that often gets confused with verification of the implementation level, is actually verification of the logic level. So the contracts that are specified in a language, which we, have, you know, we say is 100% correct, how do I know that the intent of my contract matches the implementation? So that's a more difficult problem, and I claim there is no kind of magic bullet. Uh, that's going to solve the problem. Uh, I think the answer is we need richer semantics than much more technical to the problem domain we're actually modeling. Um, and I think that formal verification basically involves distilling your problem domain down to a small set of reducible components, um, which can be coded with each other and, prove, uh, and maintain proofs of their correctness under composition. So at Agile, we work on uh, a collection of these kind of or such building blocks. Uh, or kind of ISDA and EFA agreements that we think almost all of the terms of the uh, contract can be still down to these 10 different uh, components. Uh, and then we code them as small building blocks that are composed uh, in time uh, and with each other to give rise to the standard contract financial products. So these are things like confirmations, agreements, offers, innovation, terminations, ownerships, ownerships, triggers, permission, and rights. Um, these are all small control structures that have specific invariants that uh, under composition give rise to larger than invariants that we can beat up to a model checker and then reason about the linear temporal logic properties we discussed before. So effectively, that's how you do global verification. So the details of that are uh, not trivial. Um, that's what they work on. Um, and 
I claim if you're interested in when you are buying your contracts, the first thing you need to do to start doing that is to write down what are the simplest um, rights and obligations to my counterparties that change over time. Uh, and sewing it down into a smaller set of components that you can reason about uh, is the first step to asking those questions that we need to answer. Um, I think the other big problem that I spent a bit of time working on around like technical groups is data privacy is a big problem on the current implementation of current uh, ledger systems. Um, we need to be able to have our contracts have public and private methods, and private methods are uh, Units of logic that counterparties can transact with each other about the data that they don't share with each other. Um, so there's a lot of cryptographic machinery that allows this, and there's been a lot of work on this for the last 20 years. Um, we can't do this uh, in the first generation of our systems. We can you know, say, prove to counterparties that I have a privilege to hash them, that I possess you know, a secret that can try to the right key. I can't prove the equality of all your data. So if you and my counterparty want to share, Say it is a master agreement or a hash I love, we prove to each other that we have the same. It's a master agreement. Um, again, um, there's, there's a lot of people that do these things, but they're actually agreements that actually um, integrate with our contracts because our contracts need to then act on data that's not shared in a way that the counterparties can meet each other without sharing with each other that they have the same data. Uh, make them for doing economic trades, you know, things like inequality of the data, and also things like numerical comparisons. If you're building a, an auction, for instance, you need to know if the bid of my counterparty is greater than or less than uh, the bid of my you know, counterparty on the other side, um, without sharing that bid because it's sensitive. Um, and you can't share that with the public. So, the takeaways I want to take away from talk right now is that um, formal verification uh, is not an interactive process. It is not a non-interactive process. Uh, it's a process that largely involves the debugging of your own thinking about the problem. Um, and to do that, uh, we need to rely on tooling that lets us reason about the contracts formally, uh, and we need to distill our problem domains down into uh, smaller components of the reason about. Um, and for the next generation of our systems, we should be able to ask these kind of questions of our contracts. And uh, to do so is not, uh, is not a, a problem that's intractable. We can reason about code. Um, we can reason about implementations of human workers. We should be able to interrogate them for properties that are relevant to our systems. Um, so, uh, companies are working on this in my company, if you're interested in that question. Um, largely the UV, um, so I'm not looking for any new business, but an entering today's company. So today is one of the people I think who gets the problem doing here and uh, understands the uh, current needs of this generation of contract uh, developers and is looking at building a wide variety of um, solutions that address the problems I discussed.